Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organization uh, for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Richard Kim. I'm in one, one of the GI medical oncologists currently at Moffitt Cancer Center. The topic that I was given to discuss is to, to discuss which cholangiac carcinoma patients benefit from immunotherapy. And you know, for the next 10, 15 minutes, I'll do my best to try to answer the question, understanding that there is really very limited data in regards to this topic. Here are my disclosures. Just to start off, uh, is there a rationale for immunotherapy? And, and the answer is yes, the you know, cholangiac carcinoma appears to be related to immune system. And the carcinogenesis has been linked to chronic parasitic infection, fluke infection, as well as autoimmune conditions like primary sclerosing cholangitis. We know that PD-1 is upregulated in intrahepatic cholangiac carcinoma compared to the cancer adjacent. We also know that uh, the patients with the infiltrating immune, immune cells or, or the CDAT cells really has a longer relapse free survival and an overall survival after resection, telling us that immune uh, system, immune uh, system does play a role in cholangiac carcinoma. Not only that, we also have clinical data it, with uh, using immunotherapy in biliary cancer. Now, for the purpose of my talk in, in the slide, I've only included uh, uh, the trials with checkpoint inhibitors only. As you guys know, there are trials doing uh, checkpoint inhibitors plus chemotherapy or checkpoint inhibitors plus TKI, but that's a little bit out of the scope of my talk, and I've sort of limited uh, my discussion with just using checkpoint inhibitors alone. And, the, and here are some of the studies that's been already presented, and most of them are not currently published at this time. As you can see, if you look at the studies in, with the, in, in cholangiac carcinoma, uh, the studies are uh, very uh, mostly phase two studies. Uh, the largest one is the Kino 158, wh where it included about 100 patients, but most are in the 20s to 50 patients. And none of them are randomized study. And some of the studies here down here did use combination of, of a pd one and anti-CTLA-4. And what you do see is that if you look at the response rate, the response rate is very modest at best, uh, ranging anywhere, uh, let's say, from 5 to 10%. If you do combination of PD, uh, PD-1 and CTLA-4, uh, the response rate may be a little bit higher, as high as 23% if you use combination of nivolumab, ipilimumab. But once again, numbers are very small. And the PFS, once again, very modest, anywhere from one to three months, and overall survival, it really ranges anywhere from five months to as long as 14 months. But one thing that's for sure is that even the response rate is in low tens, it seems like if you do respond, the, the duration of response seems to be very prolonged. Most of the studies uh, that's been published, the median duration of response has not been reached. So therefore, the question is, even the response rate is very low, can you do a better job trying to enrich, trying to find those patients that could potentially respond to immunotherapy? And there are multiple sort of uh, predicted biomarkers that's out there that's been looked at, and to some degree in cholangiac carcinoma as well. So one of the biomarkers that's been uh, studied extensively with very, somewhat limited data in uh, cholangiac carcinoma is MSI status and TNB, which I'll, I'll go over. Uh, can a tumor genotype uh, from the cholangiac carcinoma play a role in as a predictive biomarker? I'll go uh, into that a little bit. Uh, the anatomic subside, I think this is very important. As we know, when you do trials in cholangiac carcinoma, we sort of lump everything together, whether it's intrahepatic, extrahepatic, and, and gallbladder cancer. Question is, does the anatomic subtype make a huge difference? Uh, the, the fourth item is pd one expression. We know pd one expression is a potential biomarker uh, and to immunotherapy and other diseases. Does this apply <clears throat> to, uh, to um, cholangiac carcinoma? Uh, last but not least, I'll briefly mention ethnicity. Does ethnicity play a role in response to immunotherapy? So, brief, uh, so very briefly, one slide on ethnicity. Uh, there's some data that may suggest, once again, that Asian patients uh, do better with immunotherapy. Uh, and why is that? Well, there's some uh, serious, uh, serious analysis that Dr. Heinz Lenz presented at ESMO last year. And when they stratify according to gender and ethnicity with patients with clinic carcinoma, the high survival probabilities were observed in Asian women in U.S. Uh, why is that? Well, maybe it may be FGFR2 driven, right? Fusion driven, right? We know those patients have better prognosis, but potentially there may be an immune component as well. The second reason why Asian patients may do better is that one of the big risk factors for developing cholangiac carcinoma is fluke-related tumors. And we know that fluke-related tumors is equivalent to, to having high mutation rate. So cholangiac carcinoma is, could be divided up to four molecular subtypes. 
which are listed here. And the type one is the one that is enriched with fluke type, okay? And if you look at the, uh, the sort of heat map, okay, showing clustering of mutations, copy number gene expression, methylation, uh, you could see that the, the cluster one has the, high, the highest mutation rate possibly telling us that those patients may benefit more uh, from, the, from the immunotherapy. The last but not least is hepatitis B. Uh, we know that hepatitis B is more prevalent in Asian population. And there's some data, not in cholangiac carcinoma, but at least in, in, in hepatocellular carcinoma. Here, if you look at here, this is based on a keynote study where they use pembrolizumab in second line setting. And one of the subgroups that tend to benefit from um, pembrolizumab in the setting was patient with hepatitis B. So could hepatitis B uh, be a productive factor in response to immunotherapy? Once again, in clinical carcinoma, it's, it's unknown. So obviously, these are very sort of hypothesis-generating kind of data, but hopefully in the future, we'll look in more detail to see if this uh, conclusion holds up. So in terms of the sort of subtype of patients that could potentially benefit from, Im from immunotherapy, um, if you look at the immune cell profiling, uh, of the intrahepatic cholangic carcinoma, you could sort of divide it up to four broad categories. And one uh, subgroup that can potentially benefit from immunotherapy are the, uh, the, the, the inflamed or immunogenic type. Once again, the incidence is not very high, it's around 10%. But it, with those 10%, as you could see, there's a high expression of CD4 and CD8, which tells us that there's a high rate of, of T cell infiltration, which uh, correlates with better response to immunotherapy. So maybe that's the sort of subtype of the patient that benefit from, from, uh, from the immunotherapy. However, one thing I do want to point out is that about 50% are considered immune desert, meaning that those patients probably do not respond to immunotherapy at all. As I mentioned in the, pre uh, the, the previous slide, uh, there are four clusters uh, there of subtype of cholangic carcinoma. Okay, and the cluster one is the what's what's what we call fluke enriched the patient population, um, and those patients could potentially be uh, uh, responsive to immunotherapy due to high tumor mutation burden, uh, but we we also know that those patients tend to have the worst prognosis. However, it's, it is a cluster three that seems to be have more immune related pathway upregulated up immune related pathways, and if you look at it here, there are much more higher expression of PDL one, PD one, and PDL two, maybe telling us that th that's a cluster that tends to benefit uh, from immunotherapy. Other thing that's interesting is that in this study, uh, they found that uh, that few patients, uh, less than two percent of the clinic carcinoma, was found to have poly mutation. Okay, deficiency. And this is important because when a patient with a poly deficiency or mutations uh, tend to have high tumor mutation burden. And at least in other disease type, those patients tend to respond very well to immunotherapy. So once again, it's not very common in cholangic carcinoma, but uh, something to look for when you do, a, 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 when you do NGS profiling on, this, on, on the patients of tumors. So one biomarker that has been established uh, as a response to immunotherapy is microcellulite status. We know that MSA high is one of the most well-recognized predictor of response to PD-1 inhibitors. Uh, there's some limited data in cholangiac carcinoma, and this is based on the keynote study where they had patients with cholangiac carcinoma, 22 patients to be exact. Um, and the response rate was about 41% uh, over survival of two months, I'm, 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 I'm over survival of 24 months, and the duration response was not reached. Uh, so very dramatic, uh, improvement uh, of response and outcome, telling us that in MS, the high tumors, uh, biliary cancer, there's clear activity of, uh, of, of immunotherapy in patient with MS, high biliary cancer. Only issue is that uh, the incident is not very high. It's only uh, you know only two to three percent of the biliary, uh, biliary cancers are MSI high, uh, but at this time you know the pembrolizumab is approved for MSI high or mismatch repair deficient cancer, and therefore once again this must be checked on all patients with cholangiac carcinoma. How about TMB? We know that uh, you know high TMB is a predictive biomarker for for, for PD-1 inhibitors. Uh, currently, Keytruda is approved in, in that setting, uh, and that was based on the Kino 158 study, where it was a multi-core, single-arm, open-label phase two study of assessing pembrolizumab uh, in various tumor types. In this uh, trial, they did have tumors uh, tissues available to check for uh, TMB, um, and what they found in the study was that the TMB was not associated with PD-1 status. Okay, in this study, 2% uh, patients were MSI high, and they were all in high TMB group. And we know that MSI high and TMB sort of high, sort of, sort of going hand in hand. 
But interestingly enough, in this study, uh, no biliary patients uh, were high, had high TMB. Okay. In other uh, disease type, the patient with high TMB did respond to checkpoint inhibitor, but unfortunately, in this case, uh, at least in this study, there were no uh, biliary cancer patients that had high TMB. Once again, telling us that it is very rare. However, if you do find, but this should be checked on all patients, irrespective, because you may find a patient, and those patients may uh, benefit uh, from uh, from checkpoint inhibitor. So, next question is: Is there a correlation of response and location of the tumor? Okay, you know, in patients, uh, you know, in trials in cholangic carcinoma, once again, we uh, include all comers, uh, including in patients with intrahepatic cholangic carcinoma, extrahepatic cholangic carcinoma, and gall gallbladder. So, is there a difference uh, based on location of the tumor? Well, unfortunately, the keynote study, the first to study, the location of the tumor was not reported. Okay. Um, however, some of the other studies did uh, look at the location of the tumor and the response rate. One thing that uh, came out is that the last study here, the, the Klein et al., the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab had response rate around 24%. And interestingly, in this study, uh, all the response were seen in intrahepatic and gallbladder, and no response were seen in the extrahepatic cholangic carcinoma. So does that mean the extrahepatic cholangic carcinoma do not respond to immunotherapy? Well, if you look at other study uh, using nivolumab and derva in other studies, it doesn't quite pan out, right? There, You see here the response rate 40% in extrahepatic cholangic carcinoma. But they clearly understand that, that there are only five patients. And even in here, the trial with the with the DERVA, there's one patient that did respond with that had extra cholangic carcinoma. So once again, I think based on this, numbers are very small, but I we definitely cannot come, come with any definite conclusion that the location of, of the tumor matters in terms of the response rate, uh, in, in terms of the response to the immunotherapy. Next question is, is there a correlation of response in pdl one expression, right? This is a question that um, comes up quite often. Okay, and um, in, the, in, the, in the studies using checkpoint inhibitors, the PDL1 was checked in some of the studies. Keynote 28 is the only study that only allowed patients with PDL1 expression. Okay, other studies, they did it retrospectively, they got the tissue and they tested for, for PDL1. And the incidence of PDL1 positivity uh, can be high 60%. Okay, uh, the main may the main issue of coming to any conclusion with this result is that the assay for PDL1 was different in in all the studies. Okay, and the, and the definition of positivity was also different as well. But what you see is that in terms of response rate, is that it is unclear if you're enriching uh, the patient population that responds well, uh, responds well to immunotherapy by checking PDL1, especially the the Keno 158, which had the largest patient uh, of 100 patients. The response rate for PDL1 positive was only six percent. Okay, however, in this study with the nivolumab, uh, you know, majority of the patients who responded were uh, did have positive PDL1. So unfortunately, you know, once again, it's all over the map, and I'm not sure if you could come to any conclusion whether the PDL1 expression really matters uh, in terms of the response to checkpoint in inhibitors. So the question is, can you do a better job evaluating biomarkers for improved treatment selection for patients with, with PDL1? So I'm going to share some of the data that's uh, that we did at our institution. That is, uh, some are not some are not published at this moment. So this was a stu the study design using nivolumab that we did. Uh, just very quickly, this was a simple phase two study uh, where patients filled one prior line of therapy, and there was a two stages design where we enrolled 18 patients at the beginning. If there were more than one patient response, we enrolled, we added additional 36 patients of total of 54 patients. And in our study, not only did we check for PDL1, we also checked for PD1 staining. So here, these are the slides from our patients. So the first slide is a, a patient that was PD1 negative and PD1 negative, and PD1 negative and PD1 negative. So tumor was negative for PD1, and the T cells or the lymphocytes were negative for PD1. So in this setting, these are the these are the patients that you typically don't don't expect to see response from checkpoint inhibitors. And surely enough, this patient who were both negative did not respond to uh, the nivolumab. Second patient is a patient where you have a positivity uh, in PDL1, but you don't. But PDL1 was negative, so it's unclear if any of the lymphocytes are around the tumor. Okay, um, so will will this patient respond to immunotherapy? Well, that's unclear. At least in our study, this patient did not did not respond to immunotherapy. But the third patient is a patient that expresses both PDL1 and PD1. Okay, this was a baseline tissue. Okay, this is very interesting because 
now you see the T cells, uh, which uh, T cells, which are positive here with PD1 positive, and you also see that the tumor expressing a PD1 as well. So this is the case where the PD1 expressed on the tumor cells bind to the PD1 receptor on activated T cell, which basically leads to uh, the inhibition of cytotoxic T cell. But in this case, if you do give checkpoint inhibitors, you're basically you know, you know, uh, breaking up the binding of the PDL1 and PD1, uh, allowing T cells to work and allowing T cells to eventually cause apoptosis of the tumor cell. And this is the exact case where the 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 our, our patients responded to the checkpoint inhibitor and had a very durable response up to two years. So out of the 42 available tissues that we had, uh, you know, uh, and among 10 patients who had a PR, this was not centrally reviewed. This was a 10 PR, meaning more of an investigator reviewed a 10 PR. Uh, majority of the patients were positive for both PDL1 for and PD1. There was one patient that um, that had a partial response. They were negative for PDL1 and PD1. However, I want to point out that it is very interesting that the patients who had a who had a progression of disease as their best response. No, none of those patients were both positive for PDL1 and PD1, telling us that moving forward, maybe we could enrich a uh, patient, uh, more patients uh, who respond to immunotherapy by checking both PDL1 and PD1 in the future. So if you look at the outcome based on the staining of PDL1, PD PD1, um, you know, the progression free survival uh, was the greatest in, in the patients who are both PDL1, PD1 positive and th the median um, PFS was not reached. Same, same with overall survival. Uh, the, the numbers are very small, only 14 patients, but patients were PD-L1 positive and PD-L1 positive and PD-1 positive. The median over survival was not reached. Okay, so once again, this is very hypothesis generating, but telling us that maybe you know, moving forward, maybe we should check both and not just one. Also, with our, in our trial, we had some tissue and we also did RNA sequencing, okay? Unfortunately, we did not have any tissue uh, that in patients who responded. So we had uh, five slides um, in the patients who had stable disease for more than six months. And we, we also had some slides available in patients who progress as a best response. And once you, and we did the RNA seq analysis of those patients, and we found out certain mutation genes that are associated with, with favorable outcomes response, which are listed here. We also found some of the genes that are associated with poor response to nivolumab. And by doing that, you were able to create a volcano plot, which is here. Okay, from the responders, okay, to, uh, to here it was, I would say stable disease, the long-term stable disease co compared to non-responders. And by doing this, you could potentially create a gene signature that could be used in the future. So in conclusion, um, you know, response rate with single agent IO and biliary cancer is not compelling, but some durable responders. So really, uh, you know, not ready for prime time. Uh, maybe com combination of IO, IO may be better, but again, but numbers are very small. And I think we do need a, a, a very, a, a larger study with this. And unfortunately at this time, we cannot determine which CCA patients will benefit from IO, except for patients with MSI high or high TMB. But unfortunately, incidence of MSI high or high TMB is very low in colonic carcinoma. I think moving forward, I think understanding better productive biomarker response and resistive immunotherapy is a very important because we do know that certain patients do respond for sure. And, and if they do respond, they have a very durable response. However, trying to find those patients is uh, more needs to be more work needs to be done uh, trying to find trying to find those patients who will respond um, to the immunotherapy. I think you know moving forward, uh, currently at this time, there are a lot of evaluation going on com with combination therapy, with immunotherapy, with radiation, immunotherapy, target therapy which I didn't go over, or combination of immunotherapy, immunotherapy, or immunotherapy with chemotherapy. Thank you very, very, thank you very much for your time.